welcome to another episode of Arguably Not Anonymous. I'm your host, AJ Picaro. On this episode, I invited Denny Wilson, the founder, president, and CEO of FI Community Housing. This man has so much knowledge and involvement in behind the scenes things that happen in the recovery community. It inspired me. He has a great message. Let's take a look at some of his testimony. My name is Denny Michael Wilson, and I'm a person in long-term recovery from a substance use disorder. I also suffered from a mental uh, illness for years. On May 20th of 1995, God decided to send an angel into my room where I was sitting on the edge of my bed with a 357 Magnum in my mouth, ready to end it all. But let me back up a little bit so that you guys can kind of understand how I'd gotten to end it. I believe that they were one of four children that went to some of the schools that they grew up, that we grew up in. So anyway, um, there were times in my life where drugs and alcohol, even at an early age, were present. Growing up in the 70s, the people that taught me how to speak first and hold conversations were those comedians that were popular at the time. You remember Richard Pryor, Red Fox, okay, Dolomite. These were my, these were my spiritual mentors at the time. These were the people that taught me how to talk. Did I mention that we were four generations uh, out of Chicago and gangs? So by an early, a real early age, I was that kid that they would wake up in the middle of the night while the parties were going on, if I managed to go to sleep, that they would call downstairs to help entertain the, my aunts and uncles that were in the house. So I learned to mix drinks at a very early age. And one day while I was asked to mix a drink and take it to somebody, I decided to take one, a sip out of it. From that moment, I loved how it made me feel. Again, on this year is very special to me because calendar-wise, um, I will be celebrating 22 years of continuous sobriety Woo! recovery. And the reason it's special is because the calendar actually lines up with what happened to me in 1995. Remember, I told you I found myself at the tender age of 25 sitting on the edge of the bed with a 357 Magnum in my mouth, ready to end it all. I had just come off of a three-day binge where I was out there running and gunning, smoking crack, dealing with the ladies that were out there. I was living the life. Let me back up a week, May 14th, 1995. It's Mother's Day. I am separated from my wife and kids at the time. Nobody wanted anything to do with me except Mom. She was my last resort, so I managed to move back in with her to her apartment in the projects. I was working, I had managed to keep a job for like the last month or so, and uh, every payday we would get off at 6 a.m. because I was working third shift. We would drive to a neighborhood bar, cash our checks, and then go about our business. Well, that Friday the 13th, I decided that I was gonna hang out with the crew that was providing transportation, my buddies from work, after I cashed my check and, give it, and have a drink. From there, I was off to the races again. I knew that I had a drug and alcohol problem. I had been through five different treatment modalities, inpatient, and another four outpatient, but there was no relief. So I cashed my check, I had that first drink. Next thing I know, I'm banging on my mother's door at 10 o'clock in the morning. Mom, let me in. Mom, no son, you're sick, you can't be here, smelling dirty, stinking, just out there. Let me in, Mom, it's me. By this time, I'm in tears, still high. She managed to crack the door open, and I busted my way in. Little did she know she was gonna have to face that demon that I had become, that I had been susceptible to for years. See, the party wasn't over. And did I mention that I had asked Mom to hold on to some money before I took this drink, before this weekend? I was really trying to get my life back. I still don't know what happened. So as I pushed my way through the door, I demanded my money. Mom, where's my money? No, baby, you're sick. You can't have it. Why don't you just go upstairs and lay down and we'll talk about it later. Begging and pleading, she asked for me to just lay down. After ransacking her apartment and not finding what I had given her to put up. The whole time, listening to her, begging and pleading, not for herself, but for God, 
to come and rescue her baby boy. I went back downstairs where I found her on her knees and I pulled out this 357 Magnum that I was used to carrying because I was still involved in everything out there in the streets. And I pointed it at her head. And I said, I want my money. Being in the church, this is the watered down version, but I want my money. How could I get to the point to where I pulled my own gun out on my mom? No. I spent that entire weekend out there doing what I had done so many times before, looking for the party, drinking, drugging, using, sexing, all those things. Did I mention that by the time I was 18 years old, I knew what it was like to be inside of an adult or correctional facility, charged as an adult? that I knew what it was like to have to buy diapers for a child that I had fathered. Yeah, look at what I had become. So anyway, same thing. As a result of my willingness to listen to another man that had been there and done that, who had spent 15 years in and out of the prison system, I was able to put together a plan that involved me and my family and the desires of my heart. He introduced me to that guy that I was talking to that I heard so much about, that in the rooms of 12 Step, they said I needed to have a relationship with. To this day, I still don't believe I've had a spiritual awakening, but I do know that I've had a spiritual encounter and that I'm conscious of who really pulled me from the depths of hell. Not at the gate, actually in hell. We took that eight bed house that was housing level four and five inmates out of the California correctional facilities and turned it into the largest recovery support organization housing 18,000 men and women up and down the West Coast on a monthly basis, simply because there was a connection. Danny Wilson, welcome to Arguably Not Anonymous. Enjoy, enjoy. I am so happy to have you on the show today. I'm honored to be here. I, I heard your testimony today and I was absolutely floored. Um, you have a huge part in the recovery community with the housing and um, the legislation and um, some of the uh, curriculum for the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Tell me about your, your company and what it is that you're doing right now in the recovery community. Well, I am the founder and uh, current executive director of FI Community Housing. Um, started in 1995, Orange County, California. I'm originally from here, Akron, Ohio or from Akron, Ohio, and um, just really went through a program that was much like um, what I created um, based upon the needs of the community and the recovery community. So you've written some legislation? I've been a part of a, a lot of legislation writing um, and uh, helping get some of the services that are available to those that uh, want some help when it comes to AOD and mental health services. AOD and mental health services, and you're also involved in like housing and we, um, recovery housing is one of our services that we provide under um, the recovery support services, which kind of encompasses a multitude of different services. So there is a new certification, I guess it's just been, there was a new program, but it's just been a required certification for the peer-to-peer? -peer. Oh, absolutely. I've been wanting to get that, and I just yeah. can't take a week off to do it. It's, it's in high demand, and um, I, I'll tell you. Well, you um, actually wrote some of this curriculum. For I was at the you? table. Um, when we set a group of, you know, people in recovery and some professionals, you know, those with alphabet soup behind their name, got to the table and um, came up with the definition of recovery for Ohio, number one, and then took a look at um, the evidence-based practice of recovery coaching to develop um, the Ohio model of peer support. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so tell me, um, I, I heard your testimony today. Uh, it, it was very strong. Uh, you've come a long way to say it short, and you've done that through Christ. Absolutely. So tell me about your walk with Christ. Well, if you can recall, you know, on the road to Damascus, um, Christ actually spoke to the Apostle Paul um, while he was still Saul and everything like that. And my experience was nothing short of that. 
you know, I was walking down the street in Orange County, California, and, you know, unmistakably, I got a visit, and um, it changed my life forever. It was um, undoubtedly one of the most profound times in my life. And like you said, I've been through a lot, and I know that. But that moment in time right there when God actually um, touched my heart, the Bible records um, in Ezekiel about how he will crack your chest open and change your stony heart into a heart of flesh. Yes. And at that very moment, he did that for me. And he allowed me to not only see myself as somebody who needs him, but an entire world and an entire community and society in the same way. I'm so glad you brought up Ezekiel. As you know that the Warriors Project has kind of grabbed onto 3714, where he talks about the Valley of Dry Bones and blowing breath into these bones until they rattled. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are that new revolution. Uh, we are bringing the fight to the front lines. It's the grassroots organizations. And we are those dry bones, and we are that army rising up. Um, and so do you know anything about uh, the Valley of Dry Bones? Can I talk about that? Um, that same breath was part of what happened to me on that day. Yes. Out in California, God yes. actually breathed into me. You know, and from that moment, you know, a lot of people don't believe in delivery or deliverance, but I was delivered from so much, especially the uh, physical um, uh, part of addiction. You know, it was com completely gone. The cravings, all of those things. I was in early, um, early recovery at the time, maybe, maybe six weeks clean and sober after going through a 21 day uh, program. But um, it was at that moment that I felt the weight of the world come off of me. And at first I wasn't really sure if it was God himself because I didn't really have a relationship with him. But I can attest that to him visiting me that day to a prayer that I sincerely asked for. And that was just make me different, help me, you know. And um, I was alone when it happened. And um, knowing what happened up into, that led up to me being, um, walking down that street on, in California, I know that it was nobody but him who came to see me again. So I've been told that you uh, you've mentored a few uh, few uh, personalities out there. <laughs> there's a uh, yeah, there's quite a quite a few um, celebrities, celebrities or high profile people that I've been involved with over the years. Um, the sh I love the name of the show. Um, I myself am a person in long-term recovery, unapologetically, you know, I'm, I'm an ex-everything, you know, not just the drugs and alcohol, so there's no shame there. But um, I don't know how they would feel about yeah, it. Yeah, you can't you can't say that, and yeah. I never expected but, you yeah, to. There's, but I'm going to say that there's uh, there's some big names on that list. That there I, are. I happen to know them. There are. There are some um, people that are, you know, uh, avenging people today. There's yeah. some avenging people <laughs> today, and, and they don't make they don't make it a uh, they really don't make a secret about about no, it. So if some people wanted to draw some lines, they could uh, they could Absolutely. probably figure it out. So you've been involved Absolutely. with. So, like during your testimony today, mm -hmm. I uh, I had people writing down questions. Oh, okay. And um, from your testimony, from what they wanted to hear, some more of you. So we're going to go through a few of these questions. Uh, some of this reading is hard to uh, hard to read, so you're going to have to bear with me. All right. Let's look at this first one. Uh, what advice do you have for an addict who's in who's on? It doesn't read very well. Who's it says on that jumping off point that they think suicide is the only option. Oh, okay. Um, number one, I think it, you know, suicide is just that, that permanent solution to, you know, temporary problems. <laughs> it is. And we really have to embrace the fact that no matter what's gotten us to that point to where we think that that is a solution, some of the things that we've overcome up until that point. You know, um, the life of someone who identifies as an addict who has a substance use disorder is by no means an easy one. But if you've overcome anything in your life, what's the difference in, the, in, in what you're going through right now versus the ability to come over those things in the past? Um, what was lacking or missing in my part is that I had pushed myself in a corner to where I believed that I had nobody else in my corner. And based on my testimony, you can see that God stepped in you know, and send an angel. But I didn't believe that in my heart. I felt that I was alone. And the very first thing I would tell anybody is that, you know what, you're not alone, okay? 
what you're experiencing, number one, is not the first thing that you've overcome in your life. And number two, that there are tons of people just like you that have overcome things in their lives that are not that bad that you cannot ask for the help or at least just raise your hand. There are people like me, there are tons of us that are willing to just crawl down in that hole and just be there with you if that's all you need. Absolutely. Great answer, great answer, Danny. Um, spiritual encouragement. Spiritual encouragement. Elaborate. Um, was that encouragement or encounter? Uh, oh, no, yeah, that is, you're right. Uh, that is encounter. Okay. Spiritual encounter. I, I don't know. Well, rare, we went through these questions early. Yeah, it's one of those rare moments when I remember uh, something. So, um, I, I got that CRS. You know, I, I have that short-term thing going on. Yeah. Yeah, CRS can't remember squat. Yeah. Know, so, but anyway. no, I'm serious. I'll put something down. Yeah. You should see me looking for my coffee cup at work. It's a disaster. Nice. Nice. Um, I grew up in the rooms of 12 step, okay? Um, AA particular, even though my drug of choice was considered a narcotic and everything like that, the steps worked for me. And um, the entire time that I was in there, I kept hearing um, testimony or um, stories about people having a spiritual awakening. And I never considered myself having a spiritual awakening, but I do know that I've had and continue to have several spiritual encounters where God actually comes and visits, he speaks, um, he touches, he speaks through other people. Um, but at some point, I don't think that I was ever spiritually asleep. I may have been a little bit numb or out of content or context or, or uh, away from the spiritual being that I am, but I don't think I was ever asleep to where I would have to be awakened. So when I say that I've had a spiritual awakening, it's nothing compared to what um, I've been exposed to in the 12 step rooms. But at the same time, I do believe that um, the light bulb did come on um, and continues to come on whenever I get those visitations. Excellent, excellent. All right, I think we're gonna go through one more here. Uh, guilt and shame keep us sick. How would you help someone to see how it gives, how to give it to Jesus? And be set free. Mm -hmm. Guilt and shame, some of my two favorite um, subjects, um, simply because I know that it can hold you back and keep you down and everything. And uh, we have to remember that the enemy, it can only infiltrate us in one way, and that's through our ears. He can whisper little things in our ears to make us feel shamed about our past. But if you have a room full of people who are seeking something, let's say it's the addicted, you know, or someone with a a substance use disorder. If I'm talking to you, how many times have you heard your story or heard that somebody has done the exact same thing that you have done? It is an ultimate weapon to keep people at their lowest point. There's no shame in knowing that if uh, I have the flu, okay, and I can't make it to the restroom and I have an accident, <laughs> okay, or I throw up and I miss the garbage can. Guilt and shame are just those signs and symptoms, okay, of how ill we are. All right. So if you look wow. at them, if you look at them at, at, from the Absolutely. standpoint that you know what, it's just a part of where I am. I got to deal with it, but there's really no shame in being sick. <laughs> wow, great answer, great answer, Denny. Uh, you want to answer one more? Sure. All right. Uh, what would how what would your approach to bring the truth of Jesus to someone who is angry? at God but needs him to win the battle of addiction? That's a, that's a great um, question because we do experience that a lot. Um, I myself, even in my Christian walk, have been uh, church hurt, um, so to speak, and that is a time when I have to really um, think about the true nature of God, uh, the true nature of Christ, uh, the true nature of the Holy Spirit um, as one and not compare them to what man can do. Um, from my experience, most of the hurts usually come from disappointments from people who are representing the Almighty or Christ Himself. And if you think about it like this, God loved you enough, okay, to send His Son so that you could be in relationship with Him, all right? Number one, that's how high relationships need to be on our, on our scale. 
So when he brings somebody to you um, and you know that you have that kind of relationship, unless you know for sure that what has happened, what you've experienced and why you're angry at God is directly related to him and not the person, then that's one thing. But if you have an understanding of, uh, you know, I believe it's Romans 8, 1 says that, you know, all things work together for good for those yeah. who love um, God, who are called according to his purpose, you have a purpose, number one. Number two, at some point, whatever you're going through, whatever you're angry about, it's going to work to your benefit at some point. And it may be just to be able to read somebody else that's experienced some hurts. So my best advice to anybody like that is like, think of it as a new relationship or a restored relationship. Um, if you were once had a relationship with God, how much time did you invest in that relationship to really get to know that person, to really fall in love with them? And that will kind of create that unconditional love that he has for us on our side of the fence. And also that same type of relationship needs to happen with us. Um, we need to fall so in love with ourselves that it doesn't matter who disappoints, who hurts or anything like that, that I can look that person in the mirror and say, you know what, I love you today simply because you're trying, simply because you're not perfect. Christ is the only person that's able to walk this planet in perfect in perfect or perfectedness. Okay. The closest thing we'll ever come to it is walking on that snow out there in the wintertime. So All right. Um is there um anything that you'd like to <coughs> you'd like to say before we end this? Anything that I didn't um, ask? I think it's vitally important, okay, that everyone realize that Number one, recovery is possible, regardless of the pathway that you choose. Um, what worked for me isn't going to work for everybody um, unless they get to a point to where they ask for it. Okay, Salvation is free. Right? Christ is free. What he's able to do in restoration after that is the basis of human nature. We want those relationships. Okay. Those things that you think about when you lay your head down at night, what kind of house you're going to live in, the clothes you're going to wear, the, the relationships you're in, the cars you're going to drive, the people that you're going to know, that is all available through Christ. And not only that, you can also experience eternal life after you leave here. So I think the one thing I would want to leave with everybody is that um, Christ is the ultimate answer. Okay, for everything that we're going to go through. A spiritual foundation is needed for recovery from anything. And where you get that is entirely up to you. But at least take the time to explore what works for you right now. I told you I started out in the 12-step rooms. AA introduced me to God. Okay, but And I, I'm forever grateful for that. But at some point I stopped working all 12 steps and just broke it down to a couple. You know, confessing and believing. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Um, we'll see you next time. Thank you.